We already mentioned that according to Kripke, there is no interdependence between these two categories, I mean the metaphysical category and the epistemological category. But for the traditional approach, there is an interdependence between these two categories. For that reason, there is no possibility of contingent a priori propositions or uh, uh, existence of this category and necessary a posteriori propositions. So there cannot be contingent a priori or necessary a posteriori propositions for the traditional approach. But for Kripke, since there is no interdependence between these two categories, I mean, since these two categories are independent categories, there may be contingent a priori and necessary a posteriori propositions as well. He provides examples for contingent a priori and necessary a posteriori category propositions. So let's go on with the contingent a priori propositions. In Wittgenstein's philosophical investigations, you can find this uh, section. He says there is one thing of which one can say neither that is one meter long nor that is not one meter long, and that is the standard meter in Paris. But this is, of course, not to ascribe any extraordinary property to it, but only to mark its peculiar role in the language game of measuring with a meter rule. So, uh, you may say that this object is one meter long or it's not one meter long. But when you say that, at least at that time, what you take as the criteria is the standard meter in Paris. And Kripke takes this example, the length of the standard meter stick S at T0 is 1 meter as an example of contingent a priori propositions. This is an identity sentence or it, uh, we can uh, analyze it in this way. This we have one expression and there we have another expression. As you say, this is a definite description, and this one is a rigid designator. Let's see its metaphysical and epistemological status. Metaphysically, under certain circumstances, S, the object S, would not have been one meter long. So there is this possibility. Then it is a contingent claim. It's not necessary. But epistemologically, we used stick S to fix the reference of the term 1 meter. Then, as a result of this kind of definition, we know automatically, without further investigation, that S is 1 meter long. When somebody asks uh, you to prove that the length of the standard meter stick S at T0 is 1 meter, then you do not need to uh, show anything other than that uh, this is the way we fix the reference of the term one meter at that time, right? Let's now go on with the necessary a posteriori uh, propositions. Let's look at this identity sentence. It involves in two proper names, Hesperus and Phosphorus. We have identity here. So both Hesperus and Phosphorus are rigid designators for grip K, which means that Hesperus refers to same objects in all possible words, that it refers uh, the object that it refers in the actual word. This is the actual word and these are all other possible words. It refers to the same object, no matter that object have different properties in different possible words. I mean, with the condition that uh, Hesperus exists in that possible word. 
phosphorus is also a proper name and we know that in the actual world phosphorus and phosphorus refers to the same refer to the same object this is the truth condition of phosphorus is phosphorus when you say phosphorus is phosphorus what you mean is that these two proper names refer to the same object but since phosphorus is a proper name so it's a rigid designator that we already discussed phosphorus refers to the same object in all possible words which means that phosphorus is phosphorus in all possible words because they are they refer to the same object in all possible words this is the reason behind uh, that identity state identity sentences are necessary and we already know that uh, epistemologically they are a posteriori because we need some empirical evidence to believe that Hesphorus is phosphorus. Let's uh, let's go on with the logic behind necessity of identity. This is a logical law. For all objects, it is necessary that that object is itself. This is not a linguistic thesis. This is a logical thesis and we assume that it is true we believe that it is true and this comes from Leibniz for all x for all y if x is y i mean if x is identical with y if there's one and the same object uh, x and y are one and the same object then whatever x has as a property y has that property as well this is also intuitive we may uh, represent this principle in this way if there is one and the well if there is one object i mean if x and y are identical x is identical with y then any formula that holds of x holds of y as well let's say this is our formula colored in red and this is our argument so it says if x and y are one and the same object then if this if this formula holds of x then we may substitute y for x so then if x is necessarily identical to itself or if x is not necessarily identical with x then x is necessarily identical with y this is because we substitute y for x since we have this principle so then it says for all x and for all y if x is identical with y then it is necessary that x is identical with y which means that if Hesphorus is phosphorus, then it is necessary that Hesphorus is phosphorus. In all possible worlds, they are the same object. Here we have the linguistic thesis. This part was logical and we have the linguistic part. If A and B are rigid designators, I mean if they are, if they are proper names, then a is identical with b is true implies that it is necessary that a is identical with b is true so once this is true in this statement is true in the actual world then it is true in all possible words so his first is phosphorus is true implies that it is necessary that his phosphorus is phosphorus is true 
This is the necessity of identity. It is in the conditional form, that's important. The claim is not that Hesperus is phosphorus, it is necessary. The claim is not that it is necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus is true. Rather, the claim is that if Hesperus is phosphorus is true, then it is necessary that Hesperus is phosphorus is true. Let's now go on with Kripke's alternative view of names. So, we have seen Kripke's arguments against descriptivism, and he says, one is I mean, he says you may still be a descriptivist if you wish that way, like he states in this quote, in this quotation. One is isolated in a room, in a room, the entire community of other speakers, everything else could disappear. And one determines the reference for himself by saying, by Gödel, I shall mean the man, whoever he is, who proved the incompleteness of arithmetic. Now you can do this if you want to. There is nothing really preventing it. You can just stick to that determination. If that's what you do, then if Schmidt discovered the incompleteness of arithmetic, you do refer to him when you say, Gödel did such and such. You may use language in this way, but it seems unnatural. As he continues, but, but that's not what most of us do. Now he describes how the way we use language. This is his alternative view of names. Someone, let's say, a baby is born. His parents call him by a certain name. They talk about him to their friends. Other people meet him. Through various sorts of talk, the name is spread from link to link as if by a chain. A speaker who is on the far end of this chain, like us, who has heard about, say, Richard Feynman in the market, marketplace or elsewhere, may be referring to Richard Feynman, even though he can't remember from whom he first heard of Feynman or from whom he ever heard of Feynman. So this is the this view is also called causal theory of names or historical theory of names since we have this historical chain or causal chain you do not refer to Richard Feynman by using a description rather you are part a part of this social historical causal chain that's how you use Richard Feynman to refer to a certain person that's the end of Kripke part